We rise now for our opening sentences. O Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You will anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated for our opening hymn, hymn 435, Come to Calvary's Holy Mountain. First reading for this midweek Advent service is taken from Genesis chapter 7, beginning at verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, 
On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons, went with, went, uh, with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. The flood continued forty days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the face of the water. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 17. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subject to him. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We rise for the Gospel reading. A reading from St. John, the third chapter. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said this to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord, my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. 
Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Congregation may be seated as we sing our sermon hymn, hymn 440, Jesus I Will Ponder Now.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our sermon is entitled, Water Gives Life. Next to the air we breathe, water is the primary element of God's creation. Without water, our bodies could not be sustained. And water comes in many shapes and sizes, uh, depending on uh, the temperature and its use. When water is frozen, it's a solid. And you can see that as you look at the snow-capped mountain peaks, you know, all those little flakes of ice and snow landing on the mountaintop and how beautiful that is. But also you see it in the little cubes of ice that you put in your drink to make it cold. It's not so bad either. When water is above freezing, it's a liquid. And therefore we drink it, we shower with it, we bathe with it, we wash our clothes with it and our dishes with it, which is a good thing. Finally, when water is heated, it becomes a gas. So it rises and makes clouds which brings water to the earth at some point in some place in time. Water is everywhere in our lives. Water is also powerful and destructive. At creation, God separated the waters above and the waters below, and then he made land separate the waters that were below. All this before he created Adam and Eve. And then God told Noah that he would flood the entire earth up to the highest mountain and beyond, 25 feet above the highest mountain. That was where the surface of the water was. God destroyed all things because of the wickedness of man. But he made a covenant, a promise to save Noah and his family And his offspring then filled the entire land. And Moses and all the people of Israel, when they left Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea. God opened up the Red Sea and they crossed through on muddy ground, on wet ground, on dry land. And then God delivered a deadly blow to the Egyptian army as they tried to cross through the Red Sea. God shut up the waters and crushed the Egyptian army. Powerful. Water circulates often in the scriptures in both large and small ways. Sometimes there is flooding, washing, watering, healing, refreshing, cleansing, and reshaping. Under Joshua, God led Israel into the promised land by parting another river, the Jordan River. Interesting. Then in the days of the kings, Elisha healed Naaman, right? He was a Syrian. He wasn't even a Hebrew. He healed him from his leprosy by asking him to dip himself and wash in the Jordan River seven times. What, the waters in Syria were not good enough? Apparently not. When Israel was thirsty, Moses sweetened the bitter waters of Marah and made the water flow out of a solid rock. How many people drank from that rock? Just so you're thinking, I know you're thinking, well, maybe just turn the spigot on and eight people drank. Over a million. That's a pretty flowing rock. God always refreshes his people as the psalmist pray for it. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants after you, O oh my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Through the book of Isaiah, God invites his people to be refreshed. Come, come everyone who is thirsty, come and drink the waters. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. In the New Testament, Jesus, your Savior, launches his ministry 
in water at his baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. Just as Israel had crossed it long ago under the hand of the helper of Israel, who was Joshua, so that they could enter the promised land, so Jesus enters the Jordan to baptize you, to give you the promised heaven, the promised new land, the promised new creation. And even though Naaman was a Gentile leader and he balked at first to this healing gift of the waters of the Jordan, he eventually did dip dip himself seven times. And what happened to him? He was cleansed, just as God's prophet said. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus still washes all your sins away today in the waters of your holy baptism. And Jesus has given you the promised land there in the new creation through those waters of baptism. Yeah, although Jesus had no sin, did no sin, he immersed himself in sin to fulfill in our human flesh that which we could not do. That which Israel and not anyone of mankind could do to be perfect according to God's word. And therefore it is no accident that water is splashed everywhere in Jesus' ministry. There in his first miracle at Canaan. Remember the wedding? Jars filled with wine. And just to let you know, it wasn't just one bottle. It was like gallons. (laughs) gallons. <laughs> what did he change water into? The best wine, not just mediocre wine. The best wine. As we heard on Sunday, Jesus lovingly encourages Sunday and today. <laughs> encourages Nicodemus to be born of water and the spirit. And to our utter astonishment, Jesus offers living water to a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. He heals a paralyzed man who has been waiting to to get into the waters of of Bethsaida, into the pool of Bethsaida for 38 years. And Jesus heals him like that. Jesus, remembering how God gave the Israelites water in the wilderness, says to the crowd on the Feast of Tabernacles, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Then who can forget Jesus walking on the water? Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Finally, Jesus allows water and blood to pour from his side as he is crucified there on the cross for our sins. So is all this water just coincidental? Absolutely not. It is reasonable. It is rhythmic. It is, it is uh, uh, pattern forming. Water is woven throughout the scriptures, pointing you to Jesus. Even though every passage about water is not directly a foreshadowing of baptism, but it will point to Christ. As St. Paul so wonderfully concludes in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, Our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. For they drank from the same spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Even St. Peter states that just as God saved Noah and his family by water, So now your baptism saves you. Words of scripture, words of promise in your baptism. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, your heavenly Father reshapes and rewashes you new every day in your baptism. Like a piece of moistened clay in the hands of a potter, 
He is conforming you to the image of his son. Before the scriptures were ever formally put together for God's people to, to see and to read, the early church fathers used physical water to teach the scriptures, to teach baptism, to teach the faith that is in Christ because it is here in the scriptures. You are invited as you came in today to pass by the, tonight, not today, to pass by the baptismal font, to dip your hand in the water, to place the sign of the cross on your forehead, reminding you again that you've been baptized into Christ. Did you feel that water? I made some of you. I'm sorry I made you. But did you feel it? Did it feel powerful? Did it feel amazing? Should have just felt like warm water. And that's all it was. Because you were not baptized again. But it was a reminder. It was a reminder of your baptism. How often do you get to touch the waters of baptism? It's a reminder of who you are in Christ. So I hope maybe as you leave, you will touch the waters. You don't have to make the sign of the cross. But remember your baptism. Remember what God has done there for you in your baptism. Remember that you are in the potter's hands in your baptism. That water is sprinkled on you so that he can form you, refresh you, wash you, forgive you so that you would be reborn every day. Jesus is the vine who grafted you onto himself through baptism, through his church, through the waters there in baptism and the church. In him you live, you move, and have your being. If you were to ask the potter how he makes a beautiful vase, he would tell you that it is the water that makes the that, that makes the clay moldable. Without the water, you can't mold the clay. And before you mold it, you make it right before you put it into the oven. Similarly, your Father in heaven works in you by his Holy Spirit each day, reshaping your life into the image of his Son, into the image of Jesus. Your old Adam is drowned so that the new man, the new person, would be reshaped out of that baptism. This is why Luther says the old Adam in us should be daily drowned, and daily drowned by contrition and repentance, and die with all sin and every evil desire, and that the new man should arise and emerge and arise before God in righteousness and in purity forever. You can't rise on your own. You rise in Christ. And just as the Holy Spirit hovered over all the waters at the beginning of creation, so this Holy Spirit fills you, dwells you with new baptismal life. That's what Lent is all about. Drowning the old sinful you so that the new forgiven and hopeful and joyful you will arise. During the Lent, the church is a little bit darker. We come in a little bit later. It's filled with purple. And purple is reminding us that this is not a really good time in the church because it means that Christ is going to be crucified. But we're not going to stay here. We're not going to stay here. We will arise anew on Easter morning. So I guess that begs the question, what needs to be drowned in you tonight? Does it affect your marriage, your family, your relationships? Are you more like moldable clay to be reshaped by your baptismal water? 
or like hard pottery that needs to be crushed. Whatever needs to be reshaped in you, Jesus Christ was crucified for it all. Your sins were nailed to his cross. His blood is shed for you, and he is buried all of your sins in his tomb that you might live in forgiveness and everlasting life. So as you leave today, and as you pass by the font, remember Jesus Christ, your vine, your rock, your shepherd, your living water, that he died so that you would live no longer to sin, but to him that you would now grow washed anew in the baptismal remembrance and the forgiveness of your sins, that you would fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, and that you would fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. It's nice that he takes away the sin of the world, isn't it? But he takes away your sin. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. We rise now, turning to page four for our antiphon and magnificat. Let my prayers rise before you as incense. And the lifting up of my hands as a evening sacrifice. My soul and my Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from this day all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has cast down the mighty of their thrones, and has exalted the Lord. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich has sent them away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Glory be to the Father. may be seated as we gather our tithes and offerings, and I encourage you to grab those attendance books located in the center aisle and please fill those out. rise for our Lenten Offertory.
turn to page five for the Kyrie as we speak together. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom, and power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, through water, you reshape and restore your fallen creation, entering our lives in baptism so that we may be cleansed by your spirit. Renew our hearts and minds during this Lenten season as we receive the promised treasure of your word. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gracious God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to meditate again on the cross of Christ and receive your promised treasures. Grant the message of the Lamb of God, slain for our salvation. Bring us the riches of your pardon and peace. Lead us to see that our sins caused Jesus great agony in the garden, that our sins nailed him to the cross of Calvary. That he was forsaken by his Father, Lord Jesus, grant that especially during this sacred season, the treasured story of your wondrous love for us would draw us closer to you. Enable us to see the blessings you have poured out into our lives through the washing of water with the word. Holy Spirit, lift up troubled souls everywhere. Grant holiness to those hurting, wholeness to those hurting in heart, body, and mind. Work your healing power in the lives of those in need and in the lives of all who are in our hearts. All glory, honor, and praise be to you with the Father and the Son, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Receive his benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.
congregation may be seated. This is a little bit different than I normally would do. Uh, normally I just let you guys go at the end of service, but since this is kind of such a profound moment to have the baptismal font in the back, if I didn't get to explain to you as you came in, uh, this is a reminder of baptism. Nobody is getting rebaptized here. Uh, <laughs> just in case you're thinking that. And uh, nobody is confessing a different faith. It is a reminder of baptism. Uh, it would be very similar that if you've watched a baby get baptized, what should you do? Remember your baptism. This is more a tangible way for you to touch and remember your baptism. So think of it in that way, and the Lord bless you as you walk out of here. <laughs> 